Okay, lecture 2A, which is a very long title. Um, this and the next lecture or two will look at some of the stuff we did in the first year, calibration lines and related issues. We're going to have a more detail about what we need to understand results in more detail. Um, so we're going to have a quick look at errors, what they are, uh, the inevitability of errors, and how we can account for that. Uh, a little bit of a mind about significant figures and talk a little bit about accuracy and precision and how we can measure them. Okay, so I'll make mistakes. Uh, we'll see some examples of personal errors in, in, as we go through this uh, presentation. There's operational errors, which basically, I guess, is a variety of personal errors. Instruments are not perfect. They, they have limits of detection, for example, which, again, we'll talk about in the next lecture. And then there's methodic errors. Um, so maybe using the wrong method, you may, maybe using the method incorrectly. Uh, all of these will produce uncertainties in our results. Uh, here's a classic example of the nature of a, a method, methodic error, going back to the days when we first had cash point machines. The process in those days was that we'd insert the card, we'd type in our code, tell you how much money we'd want, we'd get our money back, and then we get the card back. Now, what used to happen, of course, was that people get their money and having fulfilled the, the objective that they set out to achieve, would walk away leaving the card in the machine so the next person could get the card. Uh, nowadays, you'll find, of course, that you get your card back before you get your money. Um, so this error, this particular error, error was designed out. Um, here's a... Here's Here's a couple of examples. So there's a, a, a table there talking about pipette errors using Gilson type pipettes, and 55% are associated with the uh, operator not using them properly, and I guess liquid sticking to the top would fall into that area as well. Maybe the viscosity of the samples, all the way down to things like liquid temperatures, um, and then seven other, which could be anything. Okay, uh, off on the right hand side, we've got a picture of a 10 mil glass pipette. Uh, which is a, relates to a true story of uh, an analyst of British Steel just on the road who for many years used to do titrations on the quality of steel and suddenly people said, well, there's something going on here. Our, our quality, when people buy the report, they're doing analysis and coming back and saying, well, it's not the quality we thought it was. Why not? Uh, so this poor unfortunate guy what it turned out was that he had been misusing his pipette for his entire working life, essentially. Uh, what he should have been doing was reading the volume of liquid from the line that's scribed around the pipette. But he, what he had been doing was reading it from the decimal point in the number, which could have been placed anywhere. So if you use two different pipettes, you would find that the line scribed around would exactly measure 10 mils at a particular temperature, normally 20 degrees centigrade whereas the decimal point on the indication of what size pipette it was could be, could be anywhere, really, uh, which was unfortunate. Um, yeah, here's something you see, you see quite often. Uh, in this case, we've got some standards which are coloured, and if you look at them, in this case, we can see that they don't seem to be increasing in colour. Uh, this is something you often see when students are doing standards for things like HPLC. There'll be one of them that's wrong. They'll have perhaps four on a reasonable straight line, and one of them will be just in the wrong place. In this case, it's simply because they had them in the wrong order. They had mislabeled samples, they put them into the order or sample in the wrong order, and ended up with a calibration line that looked a bit strange. Whether they had to think about it, or perhaps repeated the experiment, which is obviously the best way to do it, they get a good, good straight line out of it. It may have been, of course, that there was some poss possible contamination happening here, um, and it wasn't a error in the sense of getting the standards mixed up. It was possible there was some contamination taking place, which in case obviously is a, another error which would have to be dealt with by, as usual we say in these circumstances, repeating the experiment. Okay, random errors. Um, they could be anything. They could be instrumental. They could be lots of things could be involved in this. It does depend on what method you do and it's pretty much hard to avoid which is why we do repeated measurements of a sample. If you get enough measurements of a sample, we can get some good statistics, including the average, otherwise known as the mean, the standard deviation, and some other measures which we'll talk about a little bit later on. 
Uh, now, you should know how to calculate these in Excel. If you don't, um, I'm sure I have some resources somewhere which I will link to these. And there's plenty of online resources and videos to show you how to find things like standard deviation using Excel. Yeah, so there's a, a big statement. Uh, results from meaningless or the estimation of error. Um, it's, it's the classic example of this is in the public domain where people talk about opinion posts for political parties and they say this party's up 1% and down, another party's down 2%. Well, it's meaningless because the margins of error on these rules are plus or minus 3%. So in effect, a change of plus one or minus two is meaningless within the margins of error. So you do need to think about estimating error. Uh, here's another example from many of you who've done titrations. A pasta burette reading. A typical 50 mil burette is calibrated in 0.1 mil divisions. Now, as a rule of thumb, it is a rule of thumb. People can estimate the volume between those readings to around maybe if they're very good 0.01 if not quite so confident, maybe 0 0.05, 0 0.005, I beg your pardon. So in this case, we would give a reading when we quoted it as 48.75 plus or minus 0 0.01 or possibly 0 0.05, depending on how confident you are in your own ability to read the BRS. Uh, this does make a difference. Analytical balances versus kitchen scales. The analytical balances you'll find both in the food lab and the chemistry labs read to four decimal places whereas the scales we use to weigh out food in the food lab only rate at one decimal place so if we try to weigh out 12 grams in the analytical balance we can weigh that to reasonable confidence to four decimal places where it's on the scales in the food lab we can only really weigh to one decimal place now something to bear in mind okay significant figures uh, again, this is the sort of thing you do see result reported in final calculations. A reported lab result of the fat content of a chocolate bar, which has a very long num number of figures after decimal point, uh, which are probably not justified on the basis of how the experiment was done. So here's how the experiment was done. Uh, they weighed the sample out. Uh, they were weighted on an analytical balance to 4.5612 grams, so four decimal places. But because of the way we measure the fat and the way we do the Soxland method, it's only possible to weigh the actual fat we extracted to two decimal places. So on the basis of that, when we do the calculation which is described there, instead of this long 3.507, etc., we can only quote it by rounding the two decimal places, our number of magnet mag a magnificent, I beg your pardon, the maximum number of significant figures, which is three, so 3.51. And just to make that clear, that's what, what's happened here. Our least precise measurement has three significant figures. So our, when we do the calculation, the most precision we can have, again, is three significant figures. So bear this in mind when you're calculating results. It's okay to include the full uh, calculation, the full number of decimal places as you were doing the calculation, but when you report the figures, say 3.512, in this case, three significant figures, which I could have added to this slide as well. It's okay, accuracy and precision. Now, if you search for these online, you're going to find dartboards. You're going to find lots of dartboards, because it's how people explain this in general terms. That's a couple of definitions, uh, which do occasionally come up in things like exam. Accuracy, how close a measurement is to the true value. Assuming we know what the true value is, of course, we don't necessarily know that. And precision is how close the measurements are to each other. Um, so if we look at those three, four dartboards and go to the next slide, uh, a little table for you to fill in. Uh, so you should stop the video, um, make a cup of tea, come back and decide whether these particular dartboards give results in terms of the metaphor, which are accurate or precise. Okay, so pause the video now. I'll take a moment of, to take a breath myself. Right, moving on. Okay, so there we are. So have a look at them and make sure you understand it. If you look at the third one down, that's quite interesting. Uh, we're saying it's accurate because if you were to calculate the average of these results, they'll probably be pretty near the bullseye. But it clearly isn't very precise because the results are a long way from each other which means that they are more uncertain and can be less relied upon. Uh, okay, so a couple of spreadsheets. There's a spreadsheet for you to have a look at, which has some exercises. It's 
reference to the bottom of this slide. Uh, and there's a number of things which we do in the spreadsheet. I'll, I'll, I'll probably do a short video to explain this a little bit more. Uh, we measure the average compared, which we can compare the true value if we knew it, which will give us a measure of accuracy. Uh, we can also, I'll put it in brackets here, we can also, if we know the true value, maybe think about the percentage difference. This is included in the spreadsheet. It's, hopefully you'll see what's happening there. There's also the standard deviation we can calculate, how far the results are from each other within, within a result set, which we call precision. Then there's also the relative standard deviation. The standard deviation is a fraction of the average. Again, have a look at the spreadsheet and see how this is done. That's another measure of precision. Okay, so there's an exercise for you to do. Um, look at the workbook AP1 question on the spreadsheet below. Review the results and categorize the results from these three analysts for accurate or inaccurate, imprecise or precise. Then go to the next workbook after thinking about the answer to check your results and make sure you understand the reasoning here. Now the take home message is when reporting results, you use this approach. We haven't done this in the past, but we're starting to move up to MOS more serious levels of analysis now. So in any results you do for the labs and this or other modules, this is something you should be thinking about. Uh, there's also a second exercise uh, with some quite wildly differing results. These are results from analysis of Maillard reactions and it does make a lot of difference exactly how you do the results. Uh, so in this case, it doesn't matter the results are different from each other, they were done under different conditions in effect. Uh, but again, calculate the parameters and think about is it possible to calculate all of these parameters given the fact that we don't know what the actual answer is and then comment a bit on what you can say about the precision and accuracy of the analysts again. Okay, there we are. Thank you. And we're back for the second part reasonably soon.